strike me as a person who would just flake out and decide she needed to have a time out from her life. She absolutely just vanished from the face of the earth. No matter where you are, call me. I'll come pick you up. It's not too late. Everything can be fixed. Nothing is broken. A puzzling investigation. This guy is bizarre. He was like a sadomasochist. He revealed to us that he had killed eight people. And a game of cat and mouse that keeps investigators guessing until the bitter end. He thinks he's smarter than the judge, the jurors, the people in the gallery, and the police, and everything. Love and lies with a twist of leather. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. It's the Sunday before Labor Day in the hills of Oakland, California, and Nina Reiser is expected for dinner at her best friend Ellen Doran's house. When 6 o'clock rolls around and Nina doesn't show, she begins to become real concerned because Nina's the type of friend who would just no-show. The 31-year-old Russian immigrant is a physician by training, well-liked throughout the community. Nina was a lovely woman. She was small and beautiful and had a great smile. And her personality. She was very outgoing, very caring. Ellen calls Nina's home and cell phone, but there's no answer. I think she thought to herself, well, maybe her boyfriend, Anthony, uh, took her away for the weekend and surprised her. Maybe there's just an innocent explanation for this. Anthony Zagrafos, a successful businessman, is in fact out of town, Ellen learns, but he says Nina isn't with him. Anthony the Grafos comes back the next day, September 4th, he goes looking for her, can't find her. He has no idea where she's at, she hasn't called anybody, and nobody can get a hold of her. Ellen learns that around 2.30 that Sunday, Nina dropped off her children with her soon-to-be ex-husband, world-famous software engineer, Hans Reiser. He's well-known in the computer world, so this was more than your usual case. 24 hours pass without word. Nina's trail goes cold. Nina is supposed to pick him up from school that afternoon. And Ellen says to herself, along with Anthony, there's no way on earth Nina won't pick up her kids. And that's precisely what happens. Her children wore everything to her. And just not to show up and pick them up at school set off some really big flags that there was something seriously wrong. The police officer who took the initial missing persons report from Ellen Doran, he said, you know, when I took this one, I just had a feeling that there was something to this one. Investigators head to the missing woman's home. Initially, we walked around the perimeter of Nina's house to determine if there's any signs of forced entry. We peered through the windows in order to see if there looked like there is any signs of struggle, such as knocked over furniture. But nothing seems disturbed. She had prepaid rent. She had prepaid child care. She left the cash at home. Clothing was still in its place. All of the toiletries, toothbrushes, hairbrushes makeup was all still within the household. It didn't appear that anybody had packed and left. As the hours tick by without word from Nina, the media picks up on the story. There's a couple reasons for that. One, Hans Reiser's a famous computer programmer. But the other thing, and maybe the main thing, is that Nina was so beautiful. Well, TVs across the Bay Area Flash photos of Nina Reiser's smiling, attractive face. The people who knew her best were in agony. As soon as I found out that Nina was missing, I called. I called her cell phone, called her home phone. I went out and looked for her. I drove around. As more and more time went by, I would call just to hear her voice. 
Is she molesting you? Is she doing? I thought, oh my God, I hope that nothing terrible has happened, but people don't disappear without any terrible thing happening. All the publicity generates a new lead. Witnesses report having seen Nina grocery shopping on the day she disappeared. But if anything was weighing on her mind, she didn't show it. There was videotape of Nina at the Berkeley Bowl shopping, actually uh, interacting with the children and the, the kids playing in the shopping cart and things of that nature. After she leaves the store, she makes the last phone call she ever made on her cell phone was to Hans's home. Obviously, the call was to say she was running a bit late, that she was due to drop them off at 2, but it was 2 when she was making the phone call. It's a 15-minute drive to Hans's house. Investigators follow up. They say to Hans, you were the last person to see Nina Reiser. Do you know what happened to her? Do you know where we can find her? But Hans doesn't have any answers. Nina dropped off the kids as she normally did that Sunday and drove off into the Oakland Hills. It's completely vanished. Her car was gone, she was gone. No more phone calls, no more contact. Searching for clues, police access Nina's voicemail. Hello, you have reached Nina Rogers' voice. Amongst the dozens of concerned calls, they find some curious messages from Nina's boyfriend, Anthony. Hey, it's me. Yeah. You know, don't worry about it. Nothing has happened. Take the time you need. Just uh, call one of us. No matter where you are, call me. I'll come pick you up. Okay? It's not too late. Everything can be fixed. Nothing is broken. I love you and all. I'll see you soon. Bye. Anthony admits to investigators that there had been some tension in the relationship recently, but vehemently denies having anything to do with her disappearance. He speculates that Nina may have needed a few days to herself out of town, but police can't find any evidence to support that theory. The investigators did a very thorough job going through the bank records and credit cards and going through immigration things to see if she actually had gone any place or anything that was detectable and it was like she just fell off the face of the earth then a week after nina disappeared there's an ominous discovery her minivan was found about three miles from hans's home still up in the oakland hills on a quiet residential street next to the freeway in the back of the car were groceries, $150 worth of groceries just rotting in the back of the car. There was no blood, no evidence of a struggle. Nina's purse, cash, and credit cards are all there. But her cell phone points to foul play. The battery on the cell phone had been detached from the cell phone so that if people tried to track or call the cell phone or try to use GPS technology to figure out where it was, to ping it, they couldn't. A massive search and rescue team takes to the Oakland Hills. They looked at locations where Nina was known to frequent, including a local park. Criminals. They did a couple of searches up there, like 150 volunteers involved in some of these searches, cadaver dogs, uh, scent dogs. Of course, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's such a gigantic area. As every day passed with no signs of Nina, the chances that she was alive grew smaller and smaller. What lay ahead was a bizarre and unforgettable case that would take investigators from the cutting edge software world into the heart of San Francisco's infamous bondage scene. A week after Nina Reiser vanished, hope for her return is fading fast. She didn't strike me as a person who would just flake out and decide she needed to have a time out from her life. I really didn't want to think about the worst possible scenario. And I didn't for a few days. And then it, it did not seem like that was going to happen, that she was going to come back. Detectives look for clues in the missing woman's past. Nina was born in Russia in 
and she was a, an OBGYN trained in Russia. She had studied throughout the summer of 2006 and was planning on taking and actually signed up for and paid for some medical exams here in the United States to become a doctor here. Born to a pair of doctors, Nina was bright and well-educated, but she always yearned for something beyond Eastern Europe. She had a joy, a vivre. She just, she wanted to devour life. One day in St. Petersburg, Russia, when Nina was in her mid-twenties, a girlfriend was going on a blind date with an American businessman named Hans Reiser. She was the interpreter for the friend, and then she and Hans hit it off. Hans was captivated by her beauty and intelligence. Nina was equally intrigued by the brilliant and celebrated computer guru. Hans himself was a kid who grew up sort of a loner, who was a high school dropout, believe it or not. And then in his early teens, before ordinary people would graduate from college, I think at the age of 14, he took the SATs and uh, was accepted to University of California at Berkeley. He never graduated. He was in some like type of independent studies and, you know, and he worked in the computer lab there. He left the school according to what some people had said because it was, wasn't challenging enough. Hans launched his own software company, Namesys, and became an overnight sensation. Among the Silicon Valley jet set, Riser was a rising star. His potential seemed unlimited. Hans ended up developing a file system called the riser file system that's used in Linux servers all over the world. In his world, in the world of computers and, and Linux, he's quite famous and well known. If the riser file system had become the standard file system for the Linux operating system, Hans would have been worth millions, many millions. And so they were doing quite well, I think, for a small business getting off the ground. The company was worth several million dollars, but Hans refused to sell it. Uh, it was sort of like his child or his baby. In the tech boom of the 90s, Hans stood on the brink of extraordinary wealth and privilege. Nina seemed fine with Hans's love of martial arts, video games, and science fiction, or maybe she just overlooked it. Either way, she was head over heels for Hans. By 1999, she's living with him in America, pregnant with their first child, and that's also the year they get married. While Nina studied for her American medical license, Hans gave her a job with his firm. She was actually the CFO, the chief financial officer of the company. She essentially handled the books and the finances for the company. Hans and Nina wed in 1999. According to friends, the marriage got off to a good start. They were happy, they were successful, their business was going well. Nina was excited about becoming a doctor in the United States. They were both excited about becoming parents. I think Nina and Hans were happy together initially. She told me that she married him because she loved him and that they had a lot of fun together, that they had a vision of growing this company of Hans's and that she thought that Hans was really interesting and a very unusual man. Rory was born in 1999. Daughter Niall came two years later. But parenthood exposed a deep rift in the marriage. They each had very wildly differing views of how the kids should be raised. Nina wanted the kids to go to school and grow up like American kids do. Hans thought that the teachers in the schools the worst thing that could possibly happen to the kids. It would ruin them. The other problem was Hans didn't want Nina practicing medicine. Apparently, he just wanted the little lady to stay home and raise the kids. After just four years, the Riser marriage was in big trouble. I had sent Hans two books. One was Dummy's Guide to Interpersonal Communication, and the other is Dummy's Guide to Divorce. And I said to Hans, you're going to need one of these books. You get to choose at this point which one it is. 
I would suggest the one that has to do with interpersonal communication. Hans didn't take his friend's advice, and soon the rift in the Riser marriage was thousands of miles wide. This time, it was Hans who was living and working in Russia for months at a time, while Nina stayed in Oakland, raising the kids. The times that Hans would visit, it was more like a stranger coming back than, than a spouse. There's nothing between them anymore. He wants to play video games, do judo, and build up his company. There's no room in the life for, you know, a loving wife. For help keeping an eye on Nina, Hans turned to his oldest friend, Sean Sturgeon. Hans and I met when we were about the same age, which was about 15, 16. And we were doing uh, gaming, Dungeons and Dragons. And what made us friends was that we were both social outcasts. We both deviated from the norm in different ways. When Hans is away in Russia all that time and Nina is in Oakland watching over the business from the financial side things, Sean is the person keeping her company. Sean is the one looking after Nina. Hans was not going to change. He would commit to make changes, but he would immediately break his word about things. Nina and I gradually came to have romantic feelings towards each other. Nina didn't just leave Hans for his best friend. Nina left Hans for his only friend. And these are guys that have been, that have been friends for like 25 years. The relationship with Sean would last. A year before her disappearance, with Hans now back in the U.S. full-time, she started dating Anthony Zagrafos. But according to friends, Sean remained part of Nina's life, and Anthony didn't like it. Anthony was kind of upset with Nina for still communicating with Sean Sturgeon and getting money from Sean Sturgeon. Nina viewed Anthony as being over-controlling, jealous. I'm not saying that Anthony didn't have real feelings for Nina. Anthony and I had our conflicts. One missing woman and three jealous men. Cops had to wonder if Nina had somehow gotten caught in the crossfire. Following the ominous disappearance of Nina Reiser, investigators have three good suspects. Her ex-husband, her estranged husband, Hans Reiser, her current boyfriend, Anthony Zagrafos, and her former boyfriend and Hans Reiser's former best friend, Sean Sturgeon. Everybody was a person of interest um, from our perspective. According to some of Nina's closest friends, Zagrafus could be jealous and controlling. He claims to have been out of town during the, the period which Nina disappeared. That uh, is something that obviously we wanted to figure out where he was at and confirm that he was there. That weekend, Anthony went on a camping trip with his ex-wife and their children. Anthony's alibi was airtight. Detectives turned their attention to Nina's jilted lover, Sean. According to friends, he was still supporting her financially. At first glance, one would believe that Nina may be into a, quite a large debt with, with Sean Sturgeon, which would be a, a very good motive to, to harm somebody or cause them to go missing. And as investigators discover, Hans's best friend is hardly the boy next door. He was the maid of honor at the wedding. And I don't know why they did that, but he dressed in drag. And that was just a whole nother kind of anomaly or weird element. I had a pretty wild lifestyle. 
I was in the leather community. I was actually getting out of the leather community, but I'd been in it. I'd had a lot of experiences, you know, in the sex industry. I could do wild, wild things. But so far, investigators can find no evidence to connect him with any wrongdoing. And cops can't arrest him just for being strange. Sean Sturgeon had an alibi. It wasn't as tight, but it was, a, it was a reasonable alibi. He was working in a soup kitchen that night. But if there's one person with the motive and the means to make Nina disappear, it would have to be her husband, Hans Reiser. As investigators discover, the couple's ongoing custody battle was as nasty as they come. I have had a number of cases that are contentious and unpleasant, and this was by far the worst. Nina Reiser accused Hans of treating their children as little adults, allowing him, their son, to play video games and watch movies that were violent, that depicted images of war and gore. Hans believed there was nothing wrong with that. Hans was sending Nina lots of emails, making threatening remarks to her. Uh, they couldn't agree about anything. They couldn't agree about where the kids would go to school. They couldn't agree about where they would get medical care, which doctors they would visit. Extremely acrimonious. Nina accused Hans of cruelty and neglect. He called her an unfit mother, an adulteress, and a thief. Hans claimed that Nina had embezzled hundreds of thousands of dollars from Namesis during the time that she was the CFO of the company. The beauty and the geek fairy tale had come to a hideous ending. You'd think Hans's anger would have turned to concern after Nina disappeared, but that was not the case. They say to Hans, you were the last person to see Nina Reiser. Do you know what happened to her? To her, do you know where we can find her? And Hans says, Talk to my lawyer. That's it. Investigators obtain a search warrant for Hans's home and vehicle. There's a post that kind of separates the living room by the hall, and there was a smear of blood that was found about four feet off the ground. Oddly, Hans's car is missing. Instead, there's a rental in the driveway. It was determined early on in the investigation that Hans was driving a Honda CRX and that it actually belonged to his mother, Beverly. She told me that Hans had told her the vehicle had battery problems and she had no idea where the vehicle was. Investigators question Hans's neighbors. Nobody's seen the car since shortly after Nina's disappearance, but the search turns up a compelling new clue. Two nights after Nina's disappearance, um, a neighbor across the street from Hans's house saw Hans out in the driveway with a hose for about a half an hour, hosing off something in the driveway. And he says, you know, I thought that was really weird, even for Hans, because he doesn't do any yard. We've never seen him do anything ever out there in the house. DNA tests confirm that the smear of blood from Hans's house is Nina's. But investigators know that without a body, it's still not enough to make their case. And it became clear that Hans wasn't cooperating in the investigation of her disappearance. And it was becoming more and more evident that Hans had something to do with Nina's disappearance. Judge authorized a wiretap warrant. About three weeks after Nina's disappearance, investigators pick up on an ominous conversation between Hans and his mother. Hello? Hi, Mom. Yeah? He essentially starts the call by saying, Hey, Mom, let me tell you about the divorce and all the horrible, ugly things Nina did to me. You know, she didn't just abuse me. She looked for every possible way she could screw me and did it. You know, but Hans, as awful as these things are, it's still sad, whatever it is that's happened to Nina. Well, yeah. I mean, no matter all these things that she did, she didn't deserve whatever it is that's happened to her. Don't you think? I think my children shouldn't be endangered by her. 
But still, Nina didn't deserve whatever it is that's happened to her. He was really confessing to the crime. Yeah, and neither did I, and neither did Rory. It becomes clear that he's trying to convince his mom why he killed Nina. All right, take it easy, hon. Bye-bye, I love you. I love you a lot. This damning conversation only adds to investigators' frustration. Without some hard evidence, they know their case won't hold up in court. What follows is a game of cat and mouse through Oakland. Everywhere that Hans and the rental car go, cops are close behind. And he engaged in what the police calls counter surveillance. Well, by that I mean he would drive down the freeway at 30 miles an hour, even though the speed limit's 65. He would get off on an exit, get back on an exit, in an effort to figure out whether or not someone was following him. Who did he think he was? 007? Hans may have thought he could outsmart the cops. But why run unless you've got something to hide? Investigators have been surveilling murder suspect Hans Reiser. But so far, the computer genius has managed to elude them at every turn. He was doing all kinds of driving that was uh, erratic and, and means to make sure that nobody was following him. But police refused to give up. They had a number of different cars following him. The car could follow him for just a couple of blocks and then turn off, and another car would fall in. They also had an airplane following him. One afternoon, Riser drives to a residential area of Oakland and parks. He walked all up and down the block and around uh, the block. It took him about a half an hour to walk. What should have taken him five minutes. Convinced no one's watching, he leads police directly to his missing Honda CRX, the same car investigators have been searching for since Nina's disappearance. After driving the elusive vehicle to a more remote parking spot, Hans runs to his mother's house a few miles away and police move in. When the car was searched, the first thing you notice about the car, it's only a two-seater, two bucket seats. The front passenger seat is gone, completely missing. Who drives around with the front passenger seat of their car missing? Quite a suspicious and incriminating circumstance. Some of the carpets were wet. There was actually standing water. In one section, it was close to an inch of water which could lead you to think somebody is cleaning up evidence. And that's not the only incriminating discovery. Inside the CRX, there's two books on homicide. And one of the things that book says, specifically, is that a murder is very rarely solved without a body. So he had been obviously boning up, researching on how police investigate homicide suspects. Sure, Hans had been doing his homework. But he underestimated his opponents. And when he let his guard down, police pounced and took the boy genius into custody. He's carrying like $9,000 in cash and his passport. Inside his fanny pack, another clue. He's taken the battery out of his cell phone. Which was very consistent with how Nina's cell phone was found in her vehicle. Six weeks after Hans Reiser's wife vanished, he is arrested and charged with murder, even though there's no body. When I first got this case, I thought, how in the heck am I going to prove the crime of murder when I don't even have a body? It's not unheard of, but it's rare. While preparing for trial, prosecutors pre-interview a number of crucial witnesses, including Sean Sturgeon. Out of nowhere, he drops a bombshell. Sean Sturgeon revealed to us that he had previously killed eight and a half people. The half was because he didn't know if the person was alive or dead. I offered it. Arrest me. Charge me with crimes. You know, I wasn't going to tell them all the specifics. I wasn't going to tell them who and what. Just try me for it. Put me in jail. Everybody following the case is floored. 
that certainly was an unusual monkey wrench in the proceedings, because we all knew, well, are we saying that Sean may have killed Nina? An admitted serial killer, a missing ex-girlfriend. Suddenly, cops had to wonder if they had the wrong man all along. A month before the Nina Riser murder trial is slated to kick off, Sean Sturgeon, Nina's ex-boyfriend, admits to murdering at least eight people. He told the police that he had killed these people because they abused and molested him and his sister in the commune where they were growing up. Sturgeon invites police to search his home and willingly hands over his collection of guns. But he refuses to give detectives any details on his supposed victims, even their names. We didn't know who the people were because he never identified them. So it was a difficult task for us, but we looked into it quite seriously, as you can imagine. As to why he made the outrageous confession, Sturgeon admits that he did it to avoid testifying at trial. He claims he'd already taken all the public humiliation he could bear. Friends are avoiding me because Hans is putting all this stuff out about S&M, etc. So I told him, Paul Hora, that I had killed people before. And I named a number and I described some of it. We're unable to prove that any one of those people had actually, anybody had been murdered by Sean Sturgeon. I could never substantiate the claim that that happened, that he killed eight and a half people. This guy's bizarre. He was like a sadomasochist. So that's not going to help the prosecution associating the missing woman, the kind, loving woman, to associate her with him. Sean's false confession was an enormously irresponsible act. Sean's false confession did have the potential to set Hans free. It gives you somebody else who also theoretically has a motive and who is now saying that he's a murderer. You have a murderer nearby and he's also got a motive. It becomes a lot harder to convict the husband when there's no body. Now at a disadvantage, the prosecution makes Hans an offer. Tell us where the body is. Tell us how you killed Nina. We'll give you three years in prison for a voluntary manslaughter conviction. Hans rejected that outright, chose to roll the dice, as the judge later said, and go to trial. I think it was just the allure of the missing body case. How's a prosecutor going to prove it? I can beat this case. I got a good lawyer. I haven't found her body. You know, I'm a smart, bright guy. I'm gonna get away with it. But the cocky defendant is about to get a reality check. In a pre-trial hearing, the judge rules Sean Sturgeon's strange murder confession inadmissible. Still, the prosecution faces an uphill battle. On the first day of the trial, Paul Hora put a picture of Nina Reiser with her son on an easel in the middle of the courtroom. We all realize that this is what it's all about, a missing mother whose voice cannot be heard and that he would be representing her in a way. You've got to convince this jury that not only is this woman missing, she's dead. She hasn't run away, she's dead. She was the kind of mother that would have never left her kids. The prosecution contends that when Nina dropped off the children, she and Hans got into a fight that quickly turned violent. One of the possible ways that Hans could have killed Nina was he could have choked her or strangled her to death because he was well equipped to do that given his black belt in judo. The final piece of the puzzle is the testimony of Nina's seven-year-old son, Rory. He carries with him a picture he drew to try to explain his mother's absence. He was asleep in bed. He woke up, and he noticed his father wasn't in bed. And 
his father ordinarily slept in the bed with him. And he saw his father coming down the stairs with a big bag in his hand and a bag that he thought contained his mother. He got out of the jury box, sat down on the floor, and, and crouched down to, to show how he saw his dad carrying his mom down the stairs in a bag, how he assumed that she was put in the bag. That was probably the worst part of the trial. They said, hey, he's just a geek. That's just the way he is. He's weird. He doesn't fit the norm of everybody else. And so don't hold that against him. That's not necessarily incriminating evidence. It's because he's a geek and he's strange. It's a pretty good defense because Hans really is a very strange guy. Hans really is a completely socially awkward guy. The defense seems to be making up ground until Hans becomes convinced he knows better than his own top flight attorneys. Against his lawyer's advice, he insists on taking the stand. Taking the stand is about the dumbest thing this guy could do. Hans managed to keep his arrogance under wraps for a while, but I've seen it too many times. Give someone enough rope on the stand and they'll hang themselves. He was acting rather civilly and trying to give straightforward answers. The first day he testified, I thought he did quite well for himself. He seemed to be normal. He seemed to be friendly, likable. And, you know, I was a little concerned that he was going okay. But when the questioning gets more pointed, Riser starts to lose his cool. Where'd you put the car seat? Was your battery out of your cell phone? Why were you hosing off your driveway? Why did you hose out the inside of your car? And when it came to all those tough questions, he was miserable. He came up with hums and haws. He would choke and uh, cough right before he would lie. He had an explanation for everything, but the explanation just kept adding up to a man who had just killed his wife. It was clear as I looked at the jury that a lot of people didn't seem to like him as much anymore. They seemed to react visibly. The boyhood genius was all out of magic. He rankled the jury, the judge, even his own attorneys. But he still had one more bargaining chip. After two and a half days of deliberation, the jury in the Nina Reiser murder trial has reached a decision. We, the jury, in the above indictment... They were not out deliberating for a very long period of time. They didn't ask any questions. Find the defendant, Hans Reiser, guilty of a murder. Which was the maximum crime they could have convicted him of. And still, Hans Reiser tries to get the last word. I specifically remember Hans's response because I thought it was so telling. He stood up and he said, I was the best father I knew how to be. What he's basically saying in that moment is, I killed the mother to save the child. What kind of response to that? He's been found guilty of murder. He murdered their mother. Riser and his team have one more surprise for the prosecution. They're ready to reveal the location of Nina's body in exchange for a lighter sentence. During the trial, Mr. Orr and I had a conversation with Nina's mom and she indicated that she really wanted to take Nina home. So once again, Hora comes to Riser with an offer. As it stands, Hans is facing 25 to life. Take the deal, and he could walk in 15 years. If you tell me where Nina's body is, you tell me what happened that day, how you killed her, and you plead guilty to second-degree murder, and you waive every appellate right you have, there will be no appeal in this case then we've got a deal. It was a hard deal for Nina's family to stomach. But with Nina still out there, they were willing to pay the price for closure. So Hans spilled his guts. He sat down with the police one last time and gave them his account of what happened 
the afternoon Nina disappeared. We discussed the divorce, and this caused me to become enraged, and I killed her, and I shouldn't have done that. I'm very sorry that I did. What method did you use to do it? Did you strike her? I stopped the blood flowing to her head. I placed my hands on both sides of her neck. Mm -hmm. And in the most unsophisticated chokehold that any <coughs> judo instructor would completely despise you for ever using, I choked her. It was completely painless for her. It's the least painful way to die. Right there in the living room, near the front door. He said that uh, it was quick, it was quiet, and that the kids didn't hear it. After killing her, he put her in a bag, like a duffel bag, and she was placed in a car in the CRF. And she was left there until he had dug the holes where he actually buried her. He indicated that it took a couple nights to dig the holes. And the kids were sleeping. That's when he was digging. Couldn't help but think about that drawing Lori had drawn. And that he was right. He saw something. His mother was in a bag. How could that little boy have known that his mother was in a bag? Three days after the plea deal is signed, Riser proceeds down a narrow deer path in the Oakland Hills Regional Park, handcuffed to his lawyer. And we walked back up the hill through the bushes, maybe 15, 20 feet, and saw a spot under the bushes. He said she's about two feet deep inside a duffel bag when the police dug down two feet. The first thing they hit was the handles of the duffel bag. Sure enough, she was in there. Riser is sentenced to 15 years to life in state prison. When Hans gets to a level four yard in the real prison, Hans is going to learn about control. And he will learn that he does not have it. He will also learn what it means to be a wife. And it is somehow fitting that this man, who took a wife, will likely end up as one. Hans Reiser could have been a multi-millionaire swinging from the stars with Silicon Valley's best and brightest. Instead, he'll spend the prime of his life in San Quentin. Hopefully, the vision of his beautiful wife will haunt him till the day he dies. For True TV, I'm Dominic John. Got a little bit of gasoline. Welcome to another crime scene.